Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. I'm one of your four co-hosts, Tom Hunyadi, and you probably know me from my other show, Two Legs, a Paul McCartney podcast, where we just talk all things McCartney. However, I, it's, it's Talk More Talk this time, man. It's Monday. It's another Monday, and, um, you know, another action-packed episode for us tonight. We're going to be celebrating the release of Ram on <laughs> yes right <laughs> and and it's a it's the 50th anniversary tribute to paul and linda mccartney mccartney's ram actually and it's co-produced by denny sywell and our secret guest here today Whoa, are, you, to are you double are you double fisting copies of my album <laughs> no just the one are you sure because for uh, <laughs> you totally gave the illusion <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, we're, we're going to be talking about the Ram on, Ram on Tribute album here in, in, in just a few minutes. But before we do that, let me introduce you to my wonderful co-host that I'm so, so happy I get to do this show with every other week. And uh, first of all, it's the queen. You know her, you love her. You all got to bow down to her. And we know her for writing the book song we were singing. And she's the co-editor of Fandom and the Beatles with our, with our good friend Ken Womack. Kit, we welcome you as always. Thank you very you? much. Thank you, sir. Glad to be here. And uh, this is going to be a great episode tonight. This is my last one from uh, Turks and Caicos. We come back home next week. So nice. uh, so still here uh, on my porch listening to the ocean. You look very relaxed. I, I am indeed. I am indeed. It's been great. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, next up is our is our buddy Joe Mayo. We all know him as Mean Mr. Mayo on his wonderful <laughs> YouTube channel. <laughs> Get it? <laughs> uh, on his YouTube channel, he's also got the other show, Fab Gab, where he does all different kind of topics. Right now, he's uh, him and our buddy Matthew Street. They're uh, ranking all the Beatle albums right now. They just ranked the White Album. I don't know how you guys did it, but you oh. guys, congratulations on that. Joe, my White friend, album. how are you? <laughs> White, White, White Album yeah. ranking. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I, I Not easy. Star, I would have thought Star Club for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah. The Beatle story. Beetle yeah, story. Beetle story. <laughs> that's that's yeah. not an easy job. <laughs> right, right. You let's, guys. Rock, let's rock more talk. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and last but surely not least is our buddy Ken, is our buddy Ken Michaels, who's, who we all know is the host of the wonderful um, Things We Said Today uh, podcast with Alan Cozen and Darren DeVivo. That show's been going on since, what, 2012, I believe? That's right. Yeah, and uh, man, I've been enjoying that ride ever since. Um, great show. Um, you guys get so many great guests, and, and the conversations are just, you know, top notch. Um, he's also the, the long running host of Every Little Thing, which is a, a radio show. It's a syndicated radio show right now. Um, the live show is, is still, looks like it's still on hold. Uh, I have a feeling it'll be coming back pretty soon. Things Excellent. are opening up all over the place. I, right. I'm expecting to hear something from uh, the general manager there. At That's the great. We can't wait. And he also has a very new uh, YouTube channel called Ken Michaels Radio, where uh, he interviews a lot of people, such as all of us <laughs> here <Yeah>. right now. <laughs> and I just did one here tonight. <laughs> right. I, and just to give me credibility, I had to have Fernando on. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> And as you can see, we are joined by Fernando Perdomo, who is the co-producer of this wonderful tribute album, Ram On. And you know, yeah, and we got to hear this record, uh, my co-host Andy and I, a couple weeks ago. And, you know, I was kind of skeptical at first. And, you know, it's like, okay, there's already been a Ram tribute album, out, hasn't there? Uh, a couple decades ago. Yeah, there's been this, but well, there's there was something that was done by some hack called Thrillington, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, completely yeah. nothing to do with Paul. Nothing to know. do with Paul or anything. There was some guy that, that threw that supposedly threw really good parties, and right, 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 and put We're together not... the orchestral thing, right? Uh, you know, but we wanted to definitely go for a little bit more of a of a of a a Paul friendly approach. 
and you did, and you guys knocked it out of the park. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. So, for, so Fernando, thank you for being here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, but first, we're going to get to Ken Michaels and all the latest and greatest news. And Ken, do your well, thing, my friend. Do your I thing. Will, I will try to make it quick because I know we all want to get to Fernando. Mm. Ah. And I promise during the show, not once will I say, can you hear the drums, Fernando? I just <laughs> want you to know. Oh, I was going to say it. I, I, I dreamed. You no, know, I was I was named after <laughs> I, I was born in 1980, and the, the song was actually a number one hit in Spanish at the time off uh -huh. of ABBA album. Right. So uh, part of the reason my name is Fernando is because my dad's name was Orlando, and my brother was Orlando Jr., and they didn't want an Orlando the third, but <laughs> Fernando uh, was a hit at the, at the time, so... I could have been named Super Trooper. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but you are an ABBA child. Right. That's I'm, it. Yeah. Very nice. Very great. You should be cool. invited on all the ABBA podcasts then. <laughs> <laughs> all right. To start, to start things off, a new docuseries, McCartney 321, is about to launch on Hulu on July 16th. This is the one that we've heard about with Rick Rubin involved as co-producer with McCartney. This will be a six episode series with Paul going over the entirety of his career, his recordings with the Beatles, Wings, and his 50 year solo career. McCartney and Rubin will go over the songwriting influences and personal relationships that have inspired Paul's work over the years. In a statement, Hulu Originals and ABC Entertainment's president, Craig Erwich said, never before have fans had the opportunity to hear Paul McCartney share in such expansive celebratory detail the experience of creating his life's work. More than 50 years of culture defining music. To be an observer as Paul and Rick and Rick Rubin deconstruct how some of the biggest hits in music history came to be is truly enlightening. Anyone want to comment on that? Well, it's going to be interesting to see if they drop all six episodes at once or if it's going to be a traditional um, show where, you know, we get one episode per, per week. And it'll also be interesting to see the ratio of Beatles songs and solo songs. You know, I'd like to see him go through his whole career and do yeah. stuff uh, that we don't usually hear him talk about. Right. Yeah, you exactly. know, uh, not the same old stories and the same old albums all the time, you know, not just band on the run, you know. For, right. so. Yeah. Yeah. I've yeah. enjoyed enjoyed rick's interview series I, I really liked his interview with kevin parker of team impala and i hope it's uh you know i hope it's it's just as thorough and uh, he uh asks some burning questions and he does the research and doesn't re-ask all the right. same all the same stories we've been hearing for 50 years now so yep. yeah that's true so many stories have been repeated over and over and over again i hope rick is aware of those stories right <laughs> and they don't make it into this series right. All right, on May 14th, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Ram album, apart from the new tribute album of Ram On, the remastered video for Three Legs premiered on YouTube. It looks to be the remastered version from 2012 mm -hmm. when the archival box set came out for Ram. And my colleague, Alan Cozen, from the Things We Said Today podcast, says that if you download this video, it has text information about the Ram album. Mm. Ooh. Cool. Also, wow. uh, the Half Speed Master for Ram has just been released. Yep. Um, on the Lennon side of things, last Tuesday, the remastered video for Cold Turkey with 4K restoration premiered on YouTube with the ultimate mix for the song sounding fantastic, just edgier than ever before. <laughs> Um, with special thanks to our listener, Tom Brennan. Actually, I should say many of our listeners. <laughs> uh, we have big news here that the official Lennon camp, we question, was it Sean? Responded mm -hmm. to a question on their Instagram page. When will we be getting an ultimate collection archival treatment of sometime in New York City? The answer given was 2022. Yes. Said. Yep. Cool. So many things you could do with that, including the one-to-one -one concerts. Let's let's hope you know. they finally decide to put it out. Maybe that's what a, they've been waiting for. Maybe. How about an elephant reunion? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the The album "Elephant's Memory" has not been reissued. Oh, it should um, happen. Yeah, definitely. That'd be awesome. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. Also, the band Cheap Trick appeared on Howard Stern show on Sirius XM on May 11th and performed John's song "Give Me Some Truth." Ooh. Back on May 5th, as reported here, there was a virtual concert that was a tribute to the late Adam Schlesinger. And among the many performers for this concert was Sean Lennon. He did Adam's song, Fire Island, 
and you can see this performance uh, on acoustic guitar with girlfriend Charlotte <coughs> Kemp Mool mm. helping a bit on electric keyboard as it's now on YouTube. Nice. This was an excellent performance. Sean's voice is just stronger and stronger. Really yeah. works on this song. Mm -hmm. Another Lennon son is keeping busy. Julian posted a black and white video only about 30 seconds long with the camera showing you Julian's studio with a new song, acoustic guitar based from Julian with no song title given. All Julian said with the video are the words slowly but surely. <laughs> referring to the new album he's been working on on the walls of his studio were photos of david bowie and the drawing that sean made for his album friendly fire hmm. apple tv Ooh. plus is running a documentary on the year 1971 and has footage of john and george from that year from the imagine film and the concert for bangladesh uh, a few more things a book released in march on uh -oh. kindle of interest to beetle fans is called 1234 by Richard Digby Smith. Richard has had a long career as a recording engineer, beginning with Island Records in West London as a staff engineer, but he's worked at studios around the world. And this book gives you firsthand insight on Richard's work in Los Angeles in the early 70s. He has worked with Paul, George, and Ringo. As far as Paul is quoted as saying, I recorded Paul and his wife, Linda, at Island's Basing Street Studios on a record with his brother, Mike. The most fabulous time I ever spent in a recording studio. And the song he's referring to is Sweet Baby from Mike McGear, which was the B-side for a single Leave It. Richard also says, I also work with George Harrison on sessions with Phil Spector. Don't know which ones they are, though. Mm -hmm. um, his wife worked as a personal assistant at Dark Horse Records, Olivia, of course. So Richard saw George on a regular basis and even played tennis with him at George's house. And Richard even recorded Ringo on sessions with Joe Cocker. This Ooh. book so far is only listed on Amazon as a release on Kindle. Thanks to John Bazzini for alerting us to this. Yeah. It's also released on paperback in the UK, but I've heard uh, it doesn't ship out of the UK at the moment. Do you know the uh, the original title for the, the Sweet Baby song was going to be? No, I don't. All My Loving. Uh, but... <laughs> But you can't have another McCartney and you can't have another song called All My Loving. So, <laughs> hey, so, you know, once again, hey, he, here <laughs> comes the moon. Right. <laughs> With Paul, you got two hold me tights. Right. Yep. That's true. But but go. he can do that because, you know, he's Paul. <laughs> but his Paul. brother can't do that to Paul. No, he right. can't do that. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> All right. Also, thanks to John Bazzini, we learned that Richard Adler will have a new book coming out in 2022. He was one of three photographers John invited in the pit to photograph the one-to-one -one concerts. This is perfect timing with the sometime in New York City right, coming yeah. out next year. Many of his photos will be in the new book called My Rock and Roll Fantasy. And we are saddened to hear of the passing of Laurie Burton. Laurie was an American singer, songwriter, and producer who teamed up with lyricist Pam Sawyer as a songwriting team and wrote songs that were hits for Lulu, Patti LaBelle, The Royal Guardsmen, and The Young Rascals, including I Ain't Gonna Eat Out My Heart Anymore. Oh. She eventually married Roy Sakala, the man who owned the record plant E Studios in New York City, and she sang backing vocals on John Lennon's Number Nine Dream as part of the 44th Street Ferries hmm. with May Pang and even worked on songs in early 1975 with John Lennon and Roy Sakala that went unreleased until it appeared as a bonus CD that accompanied this book right here. Beatles Undercover uh, yes. from Chris oh, yes. Engelhart. Yes, excellent. That's right. And that CD included three songs in total, one called Answer Me, My Love, which was a cover version of a hit song for Nat King Cole, performed by Laurie Burton and produced by John Lennon and Roy Sakala. Also, there was a cover of the Rolling Stones' Let's Spend the Night Together, which Laurie performed, performed as a duet with Patrick Jude. Mm. And that song was produced with help from Roy Sakala by John Lennon, and John arranged that version as well. Now, you may have heard of another recording made at the time called Incantation. Roy wrote the song, and John also helped write it with him on the lyrics. And that was done by the band originally called Bomf, who changed their name to Dog Soldier with Patrick Jude on lead vocals. Mm. All three of those recordings are part of that book, 
Okay. Engelhart. I guess I got to listen to that CD now. Yeah, yeah, they're all good songs. They really do. Let's okay. Spend the Night Together has a nice R&B feel to it. Okay. Um, and Lori died on May 19th at the age of 80. Finally, congratulations goes out to the next inductees for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I know Fernando's very happy about the first name I'm going to mention, which is Todd oh, Rundgren. You're going to put him course... first? Great, because NBC forgot to mention him. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Nothing, uh, nothing like Lester Holt mentioning every other inductee except for this one certain dude. Yeah, <laughs> that happens a lot in the media. So, I know. Um, also, Carol King, Tina Turner, and for Musical Excellence Award, Billy Preston, who was a nice surprise to be added. But Todd Rundgren, Carol King, all these people, when I heard this list, there was a shirt that Stella McCartney wore. Oh yeah! Oh, yeah. Ago, uh, yes, that, that one. came to mind. Oh yeah! yeah. And still no, still no monkeys. Not yet. Still no <laughs> monkeys. Still no Harry Nilsson. I have a no. bone to pick about Harry Nilsson, Warren Zevon, Link Ray. Uh, there's so many people. I mean, Badfinger, you know. Uh, yeah. It's endless. You know, I, yeah. I, I, that's but, a whole yeah, show but, right there. Congratulations, Jay Z. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I no. always pick Peter Paul and Mary because they they predate all those people, and they're not. Congratulations, in. LL Cool J. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that's oh, all. They're, they're great. All the what they do. Mm -hmm. Well, cool, excellent. Thank you, Ken. Well, as you guys all know, Fernando is here. It's Fernando time. Fernando, my friend, let's let's just start off with the album Ram itself. I mean, I want you to tell us. I mean, what it was about the album that impacted you, and I mean, has it influenced you in any way throughout your career? Just just a little bit of a, of a background. So, uh, um, I was born uh, August nineteen eighty, so I missed all the good stuff. But uh, luckily, there was still I, plenty of good stuff. That's right. <laughs> there was plenty, there was I'm with you, Fernando. Only got hey, hey. I only got three months of all four Beatles being alive, so that was a okay. bummer. But yeah. so, six years old, discovered the Beatles uh, through a tape that my mom had of the uh, greatest hits, uh, the Red original blue? first blue, the blue, right. the blue, uh, and it blew my mind. And I started finding uh, anything I could find, and then I got really into McCartney and Wings. And when I was eight years old, I found a copy of Ram at the flea market. Um, and it was a dollar record. Put it on the turntable. Uh, track one, side one, blew my brain apart and exploded. <laughs> my, and, and it, it, it was so good that it took me about 45 minutes to get the two, to get the three legs because I just kept on playing too many people over and over again. <laughs> and for a while, it made me realize that it was everything I wanted to hear because as much as I love the Beatles, I was always more obsessed with 70s music and production. Mm -hmm. And the thing about Ram is it's a perfect example of an album that captures everything we loved about Beatle Paul taken into the 70s without too much uh, dated 70s production style, AKA synthesizers and, and, uh, and you know, other styles of music that have not lasted as well. So the mm. thing about it is that in 1971, a lot of great records came out that had a similar feel where it was about the songwriting and it was about the performances as opposed to the production taking first hand. And a perfect example, I just found out that the album that kept uh, ram out of the number one spot in america was carol king's tapestry which oh. to me is a very similar album production wise because you could close your eyes and imagine a small ensemble playing in the room and the artist's songs being the main focus and because the production i mean the performances are incredible denny and and, uh, and and dave and hugh and linda and, and the orchestra is great but really there's never there's not a single song on the album to me where the production uh, outshines the song. Hmm. Um, and uh, proof positive is in the fact that some of the songs are underproduced, which is a real beautiful thing that rarely happens anymore, uh, unless the albums are strictly acoustic. And there were other artists that were putting out uh, underproduced acoustic music like Jim Croce at the time and James Taylor, but they didn't rock as hard as Paul did on the rockers. Right. And then there were also tunes where there was major production like Halsey 
and, and back to my car and there's strings and horns. But again, it's organic production as opposed to in the future where everything suddenly became more of a technical production, you know? So that's the thing that makes Ram really age so well is that it's a record that still sounds as fresh today as it did back in 71. And it's a mind blower. And in many ways, it influenced me more than any other record as a producer, as a songwriter, and as an artist, because it shows you that you don't have to make a record that's the same song 12 times. Mm. Not all the songs are shooting to become hits. Some of the songs are destined to be, be nothing but album cuts. Mm. But it's a real masterclass in yin yang. And one of the things I always talk about is the fact that if you would have followed too many people with, say, Halsey or Another Day or, um, you know, something that's that's more in the pop spectrum, it would not have had the same impact as the fact that he followed too many people with three legs into Ram On, which is at the time was completely unique because the ukulele at the time was synonymous with Tiny Tim and, uh, and and novelty music. So Paul was like the first person to get mellow on, on a ukulele and be melancholy. And then, you know, follow that with Dear Boy, which is like a Beach Boys masterclass, you know, and Beach Boys harmony and and uh, broken down percussion and drums and, and arrangement into Halsey, which is a, a mind blowing multi beetle epic kind of kind of along the lines of of uh, of you know Abbey Road side two and and later on hold me tight uh, you know uh, uh, Red Rose Medley lazy, 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 lazy Dynamite okay. uh, Lonely Old People uh, uh, Winter Rose uh, all you know mm. all the way up until today you know with with, uh, with the Egypt Station uh, uh, medley down. Yeah, Snake, yeah, naked ceiling. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing is that Paul is really, really good at making those multi-song epics. But again, you know, the album ha- he wears so many hats on Ram, mm. so it's always a unique and refreshing listen because it's not just the the trajectory of the album is not straight, you know, safe. He goes from being, you know, Beetle Paul to being a blues guy to being a ukulele guy to being a a uh, 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 you know, a Beach Boys guy to being Beetle Paul again, to being a blue shuffle dude, to being an Americana guy, to being, you know, screaming <laughs> to, you know, there's so many different things that happens on this record. And then some, there's certain songs where, you know, he wears multiple hats on one song, for example, Back to My Car, where he's crooning and then he's screaming his guts off, you know, right. so it's, it's, there's so much depth to what makes Ram Ram. And that's why it was a complete joy to cast this record with a cast of 100 people and right. make a new version that there's been other tributes. Yes, I was joking about about yeah. uh, because Ram on L.A., the Ram Project. Mm. Uh, uh, there was the another band one called the Damn Crystals. Mm. The Damn, that, yeah, that was that was that was the Pierre McCartney concert. Right. Um, you know, and there's been other things. The thing about it is that this album we went for uh, more of a recreation with everyone's personality being the new boss. Mm. But another thing that makes this album different is that there's three original guys on the record. So it's more of a reunion, record. right? Gotcha. You know, with the original drummer playing all the parts with Spinoza playing another day with Stan playing his original flugelhorn solo on, on, um, on, on Halsey. It's more of like, you know, all right, there's three of the original guys. We would have loved to have had Paul involved. We would have loved to have had Hugh McCracken involved, but he passed away a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, we put together this album with 100 bona fide Ram fans, not just McCartney fans, not just Beatles fans, Ram fans. Mm-hmm. Cool. And, well, let's, uh, uh, let's hold on. Let's not get too far ahead of ourselves here, worry. because, sure. but, um, but I mean, because I want to try to get a little bit of the origin of, of, you know, how this project came to be, because you guys, you really didn't set out to make a Ram tribute album at first. I mean, this was, you, you just got a hold of Denny for, to do, to play on other songs. And then, yeah, yeah. You know, the story goes from this, you know, there's this thing called uh, NAM every year, which is a uh, national association of music merchants, all the major, musical instrument companies get together in Anaheim pre-COVID and they do this basically a car show for guitars, drums, basses, keyboards, DJ equipment. And uh, to make it fun, 
they invite all of their artists to come for free and hang out and uh, do demonstrations and signings. And Denny's always there. And uh, I'm always there. And the difference between Denny and other rock stars that I've met is that he is one of the nicest people that you've ever met. And he, he really respects your time. He really loves talking about stuff. And I just came up with him and genuinely said, I'm a huge fan of, of your work with Paul and you're a big major part of my record collection. I'd love to work with you. And I told him what I do. And, and we always kept on saying, we're gonna work together on something. We're gonna work together on something when the time is right. A couple of years passed by and uh, he saw me sit in with Denny Lane um, at a show at Bogies in Westlake, where uh, a lot of my friends play with Denny Lane, Alex Jules, Ben LaCourt, uh, Eric Paparazzi. And they worked out a special dream scenario for me where I came up and played acoustic guitar and band on the run and played the acoustic guitar solo, wow. which was a mind blower. And Denny was there and he loved it. And I said, we got to work together. And, <laughs> you know, change numbers. Mm. Uh, fast forward to 2019, I had started working on a al uh, project called Open Sound with a singer-songwriter, and uh, we finished the album so fast that he was like, I want to do a covers thing. I'm like, cool. So we started working on something that was supposed to be the, uh, the ever-expanding covers album, and he had suggested doing Too Many People, and I was like, you know, I know the original drummer on that, and it turns out he's my neighbor. <laughs> you know, uh, he's not going to be free, but maybe we could get two songs out of him. And you want to do too many people. I want to do a song called Some People Never Know, which is my favorite song off of Wildlife. So Same we called here. him up. We put it together and we recorded those two songs and released them. And uh, Denny absolutely loved working with me. He loved my studio. He loved my drum set. And uh, he loved how fast I work. And he also loved the way the songs came out. Uh, fast forward a year, that project fell south. I stopped working with the other guy. And uh, I had the idea always. I, even, I actually threw the little bug in his ear. I was like, man, it would be awesome if we do a concert, you know, and of Ram. And I found out that it was going to be the 50th anniversary. And I was like, Denny, we should do this concert. Then COVID happened. And I said, well, concerts are a thing of the past right now. <laughs> why don't we do an album and he's like sure i'm down and i said well you know we've already got one song down so <laughs> you know let's let's get together let's record a few songs and see how it comes out well jenny being a responsible adult text his friend paul said hey paul there's this new generation of artists that love ram that want to do a new version of ram there's this producer that's that could get all the original sounds it's great do you mind if we do this? And he said, quote, unquote, sounds good. Have fun. <laughs> uh, I need to fill you in on Paul's texting style. He's a <laughs> words. Uh -huh. I've heard I've heard Ringo's an emoji guy. Uh, Paul's a man of like, cool. Yeah. <laughs> sounds good. What are you doing? You're awesome. <laughs> you know, he's one of those guys. So those four words was the fuel of the project and in many ways made it harder and easier at the same time harder because oh my god paul's gonna hear this yeah easier because oh my god paul's gonna hear this denny realized that and said i'm making all the decisions when it comes to the singers mm. which actually made it easier because my original idea was we were going to do the album and we were going to do the single and i wanted a different singer every song and Denny ended up picking two guys to do two songs each yeah. because he liked their versions best. Yeah. Um, the cool thing about this record is that the singers were picked by Denny, not based on clout, not based on their ability to sell records and not based on friendships. So some of my friends that really wanted to be on the record didn't make the record, but it's perfectly fine because in the end, I am 100% behind every decision that was made. However, some people that could have sold the record a little better did not make the cut. But that means that this record is up to the standards of Denny Sywell. Mm -hmm. And that's something that's really important because he was very picky, very picky. And there were some moments where there were some guys that I was like, this is it. And he picked someone else. And in the end, I'm 100% happy with all of his choices. And uh, 
we decided that we weren't going to we weren't, we weren't going to go too far off the path when it came to the arrangements, but we were going to give it a new, new energy. And Denny, you know, he's 78 years old. He's a way better drummer than he was back then. And back then he was a complete badass, but he, he's had 50 years to think about this. And one thing that's, that's, that we haven't really talked about is that this was in pure COVID. This was in like lockdown, you know, full lockdown had been done it was really dangerous for us to get together. And I, you know, I, I, I full on, you know, like didn't see anybody for, for like two weeks, set up the sessions and said, Denny, just in case, let's try to get all the drums down in two sessions. And one day he did eight drum tracks in a whole day and didn't even, didn't even break a sweat, you know, 78 years old. He's in incredible shape, still has all his hair, still has all his (laughs) marble. And, Still plays amazing, and uh, it was really, really cool. Being, I mean, uh, I'll show you where my drums are. Uh, my studio is a converted two-car garage. There's the drums five feet away from me, and wow. there's Thywell, the drummer that has been in my ears since I was eight years old, playing the songs that made me fall in love with him as a musician. You know, with just all the passion and and fire. You know, and telling me all these great stories about making the record that I, a lot of stuff that I had no idea. Like I had no idea that not once during the making of Ram, Paul got behind the drum set and said, "Play it like this." The entire time Paul and Denny worked together, he put all the creative force of Denny, all the creative ideas of the drums behind each player. You know, Denny play what you want to play and he says only once did he say you know hey can you try something different and that was on elbow uncle albert where um he was playing straight time and he says can you just break it up into something more interesting and that's when he came up with and it's like that's that's against the brilliance of paul because you know, all our lives were told about Paul being kind of like the, uh, the the dictator in the studio, telling everyone what to play. And, you know, I think it's not true. I think Paul was always into collaboration. And, uh, you know, he would only do that when he wasn't getting what he wanted. And he got what he wanted from Denny to the point where, you know, he had a full choice of thousands of drummers in England when he went to go put together. And immediately he said, we got to get Denny out here flew Denny and his wife out there and, you know, completely uh, derailed his, his New York session career. Uh, there's a crazy story. He told me that he got a job producing a young kid for a friend of his his label. Uh, he's like this young piano player guy. And he's, he started working on two songs and he got the call from, from Paul to come out to England to do wings. And it was Billy Joel. And that's Cold oh. Spring Heart. Which oh, wow. He, he played on two songs on that record yeah. and dipped, you know, and he says, well, you know, I won't, I, I will never regret working with wings, but he will always wonder how different things would be if Paul had given him two weeks to come out as wow. opposed to you're coming out in a couple of days, wow. you know, interesting, which is really wow. crazy. Uh, yeah. Another thing is that Denny um, had acquired a drum set from a friend of his there was a museum in new york called the museum of famous people or something that had acquired a drum kit from uh, supposedly supposedly the shea stadium bloister ludwig kit and somehow it was sold to denny for 300 dollars, and that's the drum kit he used on red wow you know he has talked to ringo about it and it's like well that wasn't the kit because i've got it the bottom line is it's now the Ram kit and he doesn't right. have it anymore. And I want that kit, but you know, <laughs> Paul came in and did a double take because there's his new drummer sitting on a Bloister Pearl uh, Ludwig kit with the Beatles head on it, <laughs> which I think is kind of a ballsy move because you know, that's probably something he was distancing himself from. He's probably what is right. excited to see something completely different. Right. But, you know, here's here's this guy sitting behind Ringo's old drum set. You know, oh, I would I would have rolled my eyes and been like, do you have anything else, dude? But <laughs> that's the kit we hear on, on Ram, nice. you know, which is insane. 
but he didn't get the snare drum so he used his father's snare drum right. which is really cool because he still has that and he used it on ram on mm-hmm. and one of the things i played like i played my girlfriend the intro of uh of uh oh and oy and i said 1970 and then i hit another button 2000 2020 exactly the same snare drum played the exact same way by the same guy and that song was a big that i got deep into paul and i you know i bought the albums with the you know bonus tracks and i was tape trading and stuff that song was one of my favorite songs Mm. when i when i was going through full wings uh fandom and uh to do that song again is a you know complete honor and uh he absolutely killed it but yeah there's so many things i didn't know like i didn't know that paul and linda and the kids took a took a cruise ship to america to go do ram they didn't fly they, they went on a boat full titanic style for a week you know and uh and i've heard some rumors of why that that was um let's just say you can't you, you it was harder to get arrested on a boat oh, you know? <laughs> that would have been my guess <laughs> well if you would have taken the boat to Japan, wings would have lasted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to. I want to turn over the questions to to Kit now. So, Kit, go ahead and go take it away. <laughs> okay. Well, well, first of all, you know, we were talking about before the show, but uh, but Fernando, this this really blew me away. I'm I'm you know, as I said, uh, you know, tribute albums can be hit or miss, and and you really nailed it. I I just thought when you said that everybody on this album loved Ram and that was yeah. the main qualification. You can hear it in, in every well, note. I mean, really. It, like, well, who's going to be on this? I went through my mental Rolodex and thought, oh, I had a conversation about Ram with that guy back in 1994 in Miami. Oh, that guy has to be on it. Oh, I've had a conversation about this guy. That guy talked crap about Ram, so he's not going to be on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was literally, there was, there was one guy who, who is a huge Beatles fan. And he went, it, it was the worst timing ever. He posted on Facebook. Uh, you know what it is? I posted about Ram and he says, you know, cause I said that was the greatest Beatles solo album. He says, it's the, you know, you're totally wrong. Cause the greatest Beatles solo album is, uh, is, uh, is uh, plastic Ono band. And I'll give it, I'll take, I'll, I'll give you this too many people's good. <laughs> like what? what? <laughs> Well, you You're couldn't right. have you couldn't have Ringo on the album then. On the uh-huh. inside, I was crying inside. He was a drunk. <laughs> so on the inside, I was crying inside for the guy because I knew he was going to lose it when I when he found out about this, and he kind of did actually. Oh but no! I, oh my gosh! I but, said, "You did it to yourself. You did." <laughs> yeah, <but> I, <laughs> there you go. Uh, but one of the things I I wanted to ask you about was you said um, in an interview, and, and actually you just said it a minute ago as well that. You wanted to, you know, honor the, of course, the original spirit and and the sound, but you wanted to make it also relevant for, you know, for today. You wanted to make it, you know, sound modern and and for new generations. To be honest, it wasn't so hard because I feel like Ram production wise has aged better than a lot of other McCartney records. Um, it's not a record that was reliant on production. You could still close your eyes and imagine jamming, you know, and you could see that. I mean, I, 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 one of the things I found out is that, for example, Uncle Albert, that's a live take uh, on the drums, the uh, electric guitar and the acoustic guitar and the piano. That's Paul, Hugh McCracken and Denny. One take all the way through, no editing, no wow. cuts. No- and that shocked that, me when you mentioned that i had oh my, no idea I, yeah because as a huge yes fan you know close to the edge was cut every single section was a different was worked out separately and then cut together and mm. you know that happens all the time and to have the fact that they rehearsed for a whole day to nail down all those time changes with no click tracks no editing no splicing no comping and uh in many parts that's that's a live vocal too so that's another thing that's that I've worked with a lot of people that are older in their 70s, uh, you know, uh, typical 70s rock star age, current age. And the thing that I notice is there's a laziness that's happened in the Pro Tools era where people, they, they're used to playing songs piecemeal and then editing together, singing eight takes and then comping together the perfect vocal, mm-hmm. um, you know, playing drum sections 
and doing them in parts, you know, uh, comping different takes. And the thing that I've noticed is that all these older guys, there was something called tape back then. And you couldn't record every take unless you were, you know, the Beatles and had multiple tape machines going. That's how we have all the unsurpassed masters and, you know, Paul burping during, during uh, she's a woman and, uh, and, you know, uh, extended takes and stuff like that. That's great. But if you screwed up your take, you're, you're, you're burning money. You know, there's that, I don't know if you guys all saw that, uh, um, uh, uh, what's that a big bottom movie not big bottom uh, brown bottom movie where where they keep on screwing up and they're recording on acetates and every single time that the guy screws up you see the the the, the throw away a disc <laughs> that's the thing it's like you know these guys had to perform this is a per by the hour studio this is tape you know that that's that's not not unlimited so they had to perform and denny told me that at most they did four or five takes a song and they just picked the best one and then overdubbed. Mm -hmm. And uh, some songs were even two takes. He says that most of wildlife are first takes, which, you know, it, I, I, you could hear it, but Mm -hmm. that's what he wanted. He wanted spontaneous, you know, after Ram being such a produced record compared to, you know, McCartney being homespun Ram being Paul first time recording in New York you know, enthralled by the concept of working with American musicians, you know, because that's one of the things that Denny says is that, you know, this grass is always greener on the other side. The American musicians idolize the British musicians. The British musicians will idolize the American musicians. Yeah. So, you know, really interesting because that's the creme of the crop of the American musicians that we're all used to working so fast. He says that there was a union rule that was made that you couldn't record more than three songs in, in, a, in a session, you know, that you had to stop. And, you know, because they were, they were, producers were like, oh, wow, we could get a lot out of these guys for the hourly rate, you know? So, cause they're that good. And that's the thing is that these are, these musicians, they were, they were efficient and they were just great and not a lot of bad notes. There's no such thing as a bad take. There's a, as, such a thing as a not as good take but there's no bad takes. And that's mm. the beautiful thing about this. And, uh, you know, that the, the whole concept of Ram, reproducing it was not as hard because it was perfect to begin with. So we didn't want to deviate too much, but we wanted to bring in all this new energy. And also generations. You know, the age range on the record goes from Marvin Stam, who's in his 80s, to Beatrix Coyle, who's 10. You know, so... That's a big range. You know, there's guys in their 60s, 50s, 40s, 30s, 20s, and then 10s, you know, and all of them love Ram with passion. Mm -hmm. And um, we just said, look, let's sort of cover these pretty, pretty exact, but have everybody bring in their personality. And that's what makes it super cool. And also modern recording. It's a very clear recording. And me as a producer, I'm very old school. So I said, no synthesizers, no fake organs, no fake pianos, uh, no uh, guitars played through pods or, or plugins. It's all amps, uh, real vocals, no auto tune. Uh, there was no drum uh, quantizing or anything and barely any click tracks. And it's all real and it's all done with love. And our album is not just a tribute to the music, it's a tribute to the production, the songwriting, the, the track listing, which is a big part of, of the story of Ram is, I feel like it's one of the most brilliantly sequenced albums of all time. Mm. So we weren't gonna screw with that. And, and then here's another thing is also the artwork, the feel, the way that's packaged and the general vibe, which if there's one word I could use to describe Ram, it's love. It's the love between Paul and Linda, the all of the songs were written about their home life. A lot of the songs were written about Scotland. A lot of the songs were written about the ha- general happiness that Paul had, you know, and, uh, you know, too many people aside. But, you yeah, know, I was going to say, that, it's, like, <laughs> it's, say. A, it's a very loving record. And also, <laughs> it's true love because Paul was super excited to meet Denny and, and, uh, and, and you know, and, and Dave Spinoza and, and Hugh McCracken. <laughs> And you know that, that one of the things I also didn't know is that Hugh was the first choice for Reams. Right. You know, the thing about it is that Hugh had a family that he didn't want to give up. He wanted to see his children grow up. He didn't want to go on the road. 
So then he had no children. And, you know, then he was like, screw this, I'll do it, you know. But Henry, sorry, the, the whole, you know, Henry McCulloch, Jimmy McCulloch, Denny Lane even, the first choice for Wings was to take that Ram band and turn it into a real band. You know, that's the love there, you know, instant. You know, Paul was only really knew Ringo as a drummer, you know, in the studio. So, you know, really, aside from Paul, you know, actually drumming on a lot of things, Ringo was the only guy that he had a relationship with from a bass player to a drummer. And now he's got this new guy, an American, you know, and they're perfectly harmonious, you know. It's incredible the, uh, the, the, how fast Paul, Paul and Denny became like this, as a rhythm section, as a team. And that's all here. Absolutely. Great. All right. All right, uh, Ken, you want to go next? Sure. Um, a few questions about Ram On. Um, I know that you said that all the musicians passionately love this album. They knew what to play. But how did you handle all the George Martin orchestration? Well, because with songs like Uncle Albert Admiral Halsey, uh, Backseat of My Car, and also Long Haired Lady had some orchestration on there. Didn't you need a score for that? What did you, how did you handle that situation? Well, Luckily, I, as a producer out here in L.A., I've gotten to work with some of the most talented musicians. That's the thing about L.A. is that 90% of the musicians I work with out here, they left home because they came out here knowing that this is where they need to be. Mm -hmm. And some of the musicians that I've met out here are mind-blowing, especially the specialty musicians. I've been working with Caitlin Wolfberg, who's this incredible string player, uh, who I met actually the first year I was out here. Hmm. And uh, she played all the strings on uh, the last Monkeys album um, that uh, that came out. And uh, she is phenomenal. And she, by ear, wrote down everything and did all the strings just herself. She's this five foot tall girl from Cleveland who plays violin, viola, and cello. So she nailed that. And she is just amazing. Wow. For horn, we got Probing Gregory, who plays horns with Brian Wilson. He used to be in the Wondermints, and he's played with the Monkees as well, and he's incredible. And this kid named Everett Kelly, who's this trumpet player who teaches at CSUN, and he also nailed it. And again, all these guys learned it by ear, so we had no scores. Wow. And, you know, I insisted on it being real. There is no fake strings on the record. There's no fake horns. There's some Mellotron, but there's no, no fake, you know, this is not a MIDI record. This is not a, uh, uh, there's not, we, we did not spare any expense. And it came out fantastic. And I mean, that's, that's an element of the album that makes it spectacular is that there's certain songs that are so broken down, it's not even a band. So example, Ram On, Three Legs, you know, and then there's stuff that's just completely, taking to the next level like backseat like the end of long-haired lady like you know uh freaking halsey you know these songs are are widescreen to to to, to quote rupert holmes they're widescreen so a big <laughs> yeah. thing you know love that one, really. okay well one of the things that i i told you when i interviewed you for my youtube channel i love the attention to detail that was given in particular to linda's harmonies and one of the highlights for me is actually long-haired lady yeah. um rob bonfiglio and carney wilson and carney can sound a lot like linda and yeah. and rob does such a great job vocally and that's just one of the many uh aspects of the album that i like a lot and especially on ram on that full sound mm. of the harmonies there Oh, yeah. Well, here's the thing is that uh, I have so many great female singers I work with that mm. absolutely, the thing about Linda, I actually made this point in an interview yesterday, uh, two days ago. So the American Idol voice thing has ruined things for, for, for vibe these days because singing has suddenly become a competition again based on technique over originality and over the right singer and the thing about it is i will always pick the right singer over the best singer linda was untrained linda was pitchy linda wasn't really coming from a musical background mm. but when she and paul sang together and when she 
Paul and Denny Lane sang together, it was magic. Yep. When Paul, Linda, and Eric Stewart sang together, it was magic. Mm -hmm. You know, Linda had one of the coolest voices. And, you know, hey, she sings a little bit on Let It Be. You know, it's like that it, she has, you know, a magical tone about her. And, you know, there's many cases where people have brought in their significant others and it's been a disaster, you know. Uh, uh, they, and in this case, Linda gets the, the you know, she's so underrated and so unjustly sad. But you take away Linda's vocals from the Wings albums and it's Different. just not. Cool. It's so not the same. I always say that. Yeah, I love Linda's harmonies, and she she added much to Wings. She did, and also not having a overbearing keyboard player added a lot to Wings because everything she played was the right part. Because if you would have gotten any other big keyboard player at the time, you plug in. You know, I'm not even going Rick Wakeman here. I'm talking about. What if they would have had, for example, you know, any any of the big keyboard player guys at the time, like you're taking up Billy Joel or an Elton John or 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 you know, as far as like secondary guys, those big Hammond guys, like you know, uh, Tony like, Banks, like Tony Banks. But like, I'm talking about like in the pop world, like mm -hmm. uh, Bill Finnegan or or um, uh, you know, Chris Dayton or. Um, Freaking uh, uh, Nikki Hopkins. Nikki Hopkins, you know, right? Yeah. Nikki Hopkins, even 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 Preston. Preston would have done a great job, but these are guys that can solo, that can show off. The fact that the keyboard spot in Wings was more of a melodic and supporting role helped guys like Jimmy McCulloch and Harry McCulloch and the songs and the bass playing shine. Because when you think about it in the canon of Beatles of, of, of Wings, the big keyboard moments you could you could hum along with the solos in Jet, the solo in Band on the Run, Arrow the melody me. line in the middle of of, uh, of Live and Let Die, you know uh, uh, the the roads on She's My Baby, you know the the, the the all that stuff. It's there for a purpose as opposed to. And now Jimmy finished his solo and let's have Billy take an organ solo. Again, nothing against that. It would have been great to have a foil in that band, you know, but maybe that's where the horns came in, you know. Take it away, Thaddeus. You know, that's cool. <laughs> but not having an overbearing keyboard presence made Wings more of a digestible band and more of a crossover because the keyboard had a you know as a huge progressive rock fan the keyboard had a major explosion and all of a sudden everybody had that synthesis sometimes bands like utopia had three keyboard players there's one guy that plays Rhodes, one guy that plays organ and then there's the m frog labat on the m modular synthesizers trapped inside a huge you know a huge plexiglass ball you know doing that thing and there were moments like that, you know, loop the first in, you know, on the moon, uh, great synthesizer moments in, in, uh, in Spirits of Ancient Egypt, great synthesizer moments and with a little luck, which is all synthesizers, arrow through mm. me with synthesizers, but they're not masturbatory. They're not, they're not look at me moments. They're there to serve a purpose. Now back to Ram, Linda's vocals are such an important element because they're the right sound for the songs and they help the songs get to where they need to be vocally so as far as singers you know i had some real badass singers sing on this but they all channeled the vibe of linda even somebody like durga mcbroom who sings on three legs she was the wailing you know one of the wailing black backup singer girls for pink floyd doing you know great gig in the sky every night but she loves ram and when she's singing those backup lines on, on three legs, it's more of a gospel feel, but it still has that loose, untrained energy that Linda has. And you mentioned Long Haired Lady. I was like, I really wanted that one to be a couple. And I, I immediately thought of Rob Bonfiglio and his wife, Carney Wilson of Wilson Phillips, the daughter of Brian Wilson, 
who is an incredible singer, but has that it factor to me of the fact that she's not a wailer. She's not a extreme look at me type singer, but she has vibe. Mm -hmm. And when she those parts it sounds great and i had no idea they were going to do this but they also included lola bonfiglio their daughter so we have three generations of wilson on that on, on that with you know being the daughter of brian wilson the granddaughter of brian wilson making her debut on this record so how's that wow. okay uh, you know the same thing goes with ali J, uh who is a, a grammy award nominated artist from dominican republic who sings on dear boy she has that Linda feel to it. Jody Quine from Canada, who sings the Linda harmony on, on Ram On. Perfect Linda type feel. Mm -hmm. You know, Lee Zuzik and uh, uh, the aforementioned uh, uh, Beatrix Coyle, um, who sing a lot of the female parts on, on Monkberry Moon Delight and Smile Away. Again, it's loose, you know. She, you know, she's 10 years old, uh, Beatrix, but it's like it's the right vibe because it's unhinged and it's enthusiastic. And right. one thing about Linda is that she was always enthusiastic, which sometimes led to pitch problems live and the infamous uh, <laughs> yeah. Howard Stern tape. Right. Who are you, Howard Stern? That's not <laughs> But, you know, I, it, it happens to the best of us. It's happened to Paul. It's happened to everyone. You know, there's, right. there's, there's tapes around of even somebody like Paul not sounding up to stuff, especially lately. But it's not nice. Don't ever do that because, you know, especially somebody like Linda that's, you know, so brutalized by people, yeah. any of that stuff could be very detrimental. But, you know, that's the thing is when it came to choosing people, I wanted people that were going to capture the vibe without having to put in the work. For example, our mixing engineer on the record, uh, Zach Ziskin, he didn't have to pull out his copy of Ram, listen to it and say, this is what it needs to sound like. It's already in his DNA. It's already in my DNA, you know, the guitar tones, the way I wanted to treat the stereo spectrum, the way that the drums were mic'd, the way that the drums were tuned, the way that the choices of guitars, the fact that all the bass players that I picked, see, this is really funny because Denny has a lot of famous friends and he asked one of, he told one of his famous friends about the record trying to get him on. And he said, well, my first question is, he's British, who's playing bass? And that's the thing. I immediately said, these are the people I know that are going to play the songs with that Paul feel. Play with a pick, flat wound strings, in some case Rickenbacker, in some case there's some people that love using their Hofners. It's cool. But for example, John Montagna, he's writing a book on Paul's bass playing. Yeah. You know, he's an incredible guy. He's played with everybody from, you know, the Happy Together Tour to, you know, Alan Parsons and That's Todd right. Run. Yep. You know, his bass is pictured inside because he just had an article in Bass Player in Bass Musician Magazine about, you know, he's like the first time he ran the song, he felt like he was in a cover band. And he's like, I got to fix this. Mm -hmm. So he started really thinking about getting it, uh, getting the vibe right. And he absolutely smokes on, on Another Day and Smile Away. Right. Um, and there's guys that are unknown on the record, which like Roger Hudai from uh, this band called Ex Norwegian, who plays on Monkberry. And he just completely nails the vibe. And we did something fun on that one. We had the bass doubled by cello, a cellist from Israel named uh, Ruti Celli. So it's bass and cello at the same time, which gives that chuck motion, which is a lot of fun. And um, Dan Rothschild, who sings Too Many People in Heart of the Country. Oh. You know, he was the bass player in Heart for years. He was in Tonic. His dad produced The Doors. He's the bass player in Echo in the Canyon. He's a chameleon. And he absolutely nailed uh, too many people and also played upright bass on, on House of the uh, Heart of the Country, which is incredible. House of the Country is Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Heart of the Country is, is, is Ram. I, I, I go to this, this thing where all of a sudden I'll be talking about Dear Boy and I'll say Dear Friend. Like, wrong <laughs> album. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, I mean, everybody that's on the record was, number one, enthusiastic to be on it. Number two, completely intimidated. But, you know, they, they all brought A-grade performances. And, uh, you know, Denny was like, I want to hear five people sing each song, which in one way is a little annoying because everybody put in the work and four people didn't get the gig. But damn, it led to amazing results. Because, for example, my initial idea on, uh, on Dear Boy was to have the Brian Wilson band sing it as a group. 
and they gave it a shot and they did great but literally like that was that that's another day in backseat of my car were the last three songs to be cast and i had been recommended by my friend jason burke to call this guy adrian bourgeois who is the who is a he's like 30 and he's a, a pretty unknown bubbling under singer songwriter his dad was uh his dad is uh brent bourgeois of bourgeois tag uh, oh yeah incredible song and i i told him you know give these a shot but i really wasn't expecting to be blown away and when we heard him sing dear boy everybody else felt was 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 suddenly second place and we both were unanimous on that saying that it gave us the feels and we were completely unexpected um brentley gore who i'd never worked with before who denny had done some demos with you know he did backseat in my car and he was unbeatable and it's funny because like there was a, a group that I had contacted literally first when we went to go do this that I got radio silence from. I finally got an email saying they wanted to do backseat in my car and it broke my heart and I had to tell them, no, we had where you had picked that one, you know? And I said, well, you, you know, I would love to have you guys sing some backup on it. No response, you know? So, oh, well, it, it broke my heart because I really wanted them on this, but I'm 100% behind every single one of the choices of the people that are on the record. And, you know, I, the, the general response has been fantastic. People love it. But I have had a few people say, I don't recognize any of the people on this record. Well, it's not about them. It's about Ram. Right. It's about paying tribute to Ram. And, you know, nobody knew any of the people on, on Jesus Christ Superstar. You know, <laughs> nobody knew any of the people in Tommy the Musical. You know, I hope people discover people through this record because everybody on here deserves your attention. Yeah. And I feel like as an album, it works better this way where there's no distracting. Oh, you know, I see, I see uh, uh, this boy band is doing this song. I'm not even going to listen to that. You know, I want you to listen to the album, enjoy it as a companion piece to your favorite Ram classic, as I call it. And, you know, it's, it's designed to be another look at Ram with three of the original guys and a bunch of people that are going to give it the, the attention and the love it deserves and the passion it deserves. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think you did a phenomenal job. I have uh, one amen. really important question, uh, but I want Joe to get his questions in. So only if you have time after that. <laughs> I, oh, I have one. <laughs> so we're good. Actually, I, I talked to my, the other, the next interview they're, 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 They have no schedule, so we're good. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah. uh, can I ask the one question? Bring it on. Okay. Spin it you on. Did, did, I know that if you look on YouTube, it is flooded with interviews with you and Denny. God bless you both. It's all over the place. You've even made videos for every song. Right. <laughs> and uh, one of the interviews that I watched just recently was with this guy from Australia who I was very uh, impressed with, Elliot Roberts. And um, prior to doing this interview, and you and Denny were in it, he made a video which gained him a lot of attention which all has to do with was Ram the first indie pop album. How do you feel on that subject? Okay. Early on in the making of Ram on, which by the way, just a side note, day one of Ram on was December 13th. The final day of Ram on tracking in the mixing process started January 27th. This came together very fast in the beginning. I was always the one cheerleading the project by saying, look at all this interest that Ram is starting to get. And it's not even the 50th anniversary yet. And I showed him that video and said, I sent them, I sent Denny this video and said, look at this kid in his 20s. He's in Australia. He's made this video and it's gone viral. And I love the way he talks. Hmm. I love the way he, I love this video where he, you know, I, I, I also love his sense of humor because he made that video where he says, I watched all the Beatles biopics, you know, and there's, you know, <laughs> made fun of the fact that he mispronounced biopic, you know, biopic, you know, whatever. <laughs> I love all those videos because I even showed Denny the one where um, the Linda McCartney story where they show the scene of Wings playing at the, uh, the university. I'm like, that guy looks nothing like you. You know, he's like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, he's like, he's like did he? You know, the, hey, hey, you know, that's a Beatles tune, whatever. So, whatever. So I showed him that video 
And uh, I'll, I'll be honest, this is 100% honest. Denny hasn't enjoyed every interview we've done. And he started getting tired. And I told him about Elliot. And I said, okay, we got this interview I got us. He's like, you do it alone. I'm like, we might, we really might want to do this one. It was the guy I sent you. And he didn't, he's like, okay, I'll do it. And it turned out to be fantastic. It was really, really cool because, you know, I love the fact that you guys really know your stuff and all the interviews we've done, there's been a, a variety of people that, that are, you know, asking all the right questions like you guys. And then there's people that just keep on asking the same stuff or haven't heard the record, have no interest or whatever. So, you know, in this case, it was really, really cool. Now, was Ram the first indie pop album? There's two albums that I am going to pigeonhole together because they have a similar trait in the fact that they're all over the place. There was a famous review of Brian Eno's Here Come the Warm Jets saying that that album, you could pinpoint complete genres that were created from each song on that album. Same thing goes to Ram. Heart of the Country is what we call Americana today. There's Baroque pop in Dear Boy, you know, Ram On. There's blues rock, you know, freaking Smile Away. I can imagine Stevie Ray Vaughan, Kenny Wayne Shepherd doing that song, you know. It's a blues romp. It's a blues shuffle. You know, Monkberry, it's, it's, it's very indie. It's very, like, it kind of reminds me, the vocal delivery reminds me a little bit of Isaac Brock of Modest Mouse. You know, it's that unhinged, you know, kind of like Paul took influence from Screaming Jay Hollians. I actually think that Paul might even been influenced by Captain Beefheart on that one. You know, long shot. But with Three Imagine, we all know that Paul is still always listening to music and always still looking for new stuff because when I found out he was working with Crangbin, it blew my mind because everybody that knows me knows that I've been obsessed with Crangbin since they came out. And they're very much an indie pop, indie, indie experimental, bubbling under. You either don't know about them or love them. And the fact that Paul knows who they are to the point of working with them is pure example that Paul was all over the place with his listening back then. So the thing about Ram and Here Come the Warm Jets is they're albums that inspired entire genres. And uh, indie pop is a very um, accurate assumption because it has the same amount of variety that, say, uh, you know, like a uh, uh, freaking, uh, um, it has the same amount of variety that a lot of records like by people like Wilco or um, freaking what's in that guy? Um, uh, you know, freaking Sufjan Stevens. Um, you know, these albums, they don't follow a certain path. It's not like a Justin Bieber record where it's, you know, every song sounds like a single. You know, these albums have, they're an army. You know, you've got the hit singles and you've got the challenging album cuts, the big ballads. It's got a lot of diversion from the plane. You know, it's not a straight shot. You know, there's moments of, of it's like a film. You know, if James Bond was all car chase sequences, it would suck. You yeah. got to have parts where, you know, James is having car moments and parts where he's flirting and parts where he's captured and parts where there's drama and suspense you know ram has drama and suspense it's there's there's ebbs and flows and yings and yangs and and i feel like that makes it a template to what we consider indie pop today and so he's right okay how would you differentiate that from what paul was doing in the beatles Let's just let's just take all the songs that Paul did on the White Album, and Correct. you make that one album. It's all over the Correct. place musically, and that Correct. inspired so many people to write songs in those genres. Correct, but it's the product of four guys, and that's saying you know again, Bram is still a solo record. 
Ram is still really the, the second Paul McCartney solo record. So that have all the songs written by either Paul or Paul and Linda and have it be that diverse. You know, the White Album, sure, Paul dominates as always, but you know, Paul had really little to do with Revolution Number Nine. You know, there's a lot of the weirder moments on record, like Long, 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 Savoy Truffle. Um, you know, there, there, it's a, it's a, it's a process with different personalities and different power struggles. You know, Ram is the product of Paul and Linda and his musicians. Hmm. You know, and the fact that it's a solo album that has that much variety. That's why I'm I'm gonna go ahead and throw other albums in that have a similar thing. Todd right. Rung, something, anything, you know, perfect example. Brian Eno's Here Come the Warm Jets. Uh freaking uh further along the line, Stevie Wonder's uh, Songs in the Key of Life. Um further along, you know, there's a lot of cases where it's like albums have a lot of different ground that's being covered and paul never stopped tug of war sure you know freaking memory almost full i love that record hmm. you know and there's, there's a lot of variety in every single one of them all the way down to mccartney three you know if he he at this point in paul's career he could have been there's a scene in echo in the canyon the movie i'm in where where david crosby said that there's a point in your career where you should just stop, and that's when you just turn on the smoke machine and play all the hits. You know, Paul could have been, you know, playing at the Chili Festival, and here's, here's a medley of my hits, you know. But Paul's always going to be, he, he's always going to take the, the, the less lazy route. And um, it's a beautiful thing. And, you know, Ram has got a lot of variety and a lot of different sides to the onion, a lot of different layers. So good thing. Okay. All right. I'll let you talk, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let me just say first that, you know, Ram is my favorite Paul album. And uh, we, we were talking a little bit before we went on live saying how you can get rammed out, which I'd been getting rammed out a lot lately. So when it came time to listen to Ram on, uh, I was like, oh, okay, do I really am i really up for this now we're going to talk to fernando i want to be familiarized with this so yesterday morning very early like eight o'clock in the morning or something i i listened to it and i really loved it uh and i was i was very skeptical i'm like oh it's just going to be you know a rehash of the stuff probably but let, let's see and i just thought it sounded so fresh again because it it's close to the ram album you know it's it's faithful all little nuances I'm hearing that I expect to hear here and there. But at the same time, it manages to be exciting and fresh. So much so that even though I'm rammed out pretty much, <laughs> I said, you know, it's a beautiful, gorgeous day today. And after I listened to your album, I said, I'm going to I'm going to grab Ram off on a CD off the shelf and I'm going to play that. And, it, and it, my girlfriend and I we, all day when we were driving, I played Ram again and, and I, I wanted to hear it. Your Your album reminded me of why I love the album so much that's, that's how it, that, that's how that, i felt that, that warms me hot uh it's exactly what, <laughs> what, what we are trying to go for here right we're not we're not seeking to replace ram classic it's it's uh it's a it's a, a complete companion situation and the thing about ram is that it's still fresh today and the only reason i'm rammed out is that you know look working on this record did going through the 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 process of creating it you know it was hearing these songs thousands and thousands of times but i still man i mean ram's an album that's been a part of my dna for now 32 years and i've listened to that album you know dozens of times a year since then and it still excites me when i put on that record and too many people comes on i still get excited and the thing about ram is it's designed to last when it comes to, you know, uh, when it comes to um, you know, it's an album that sticks with you and it gets in your DNA and whenever it comes on the radio and you hear Uncle Albert or you hear Another Day, you're like, let me pull that thing out again and listen to it. As well. <laughs> because I have distinct memories of hearing that record on my, you know, on my turntable. Um, 
my Walkman was my co- constant companion. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember being on family trips and my mom being annoyed. And we're like, you know, looking at basilicas in, in France and, she, and I'm there with my Walkman listening to Ram and Wildlife and Red Rose Speedway and Wings Over America and Wings at the Speed of Sound and Back to the Egg and, you know, my weird bootleg that I recorded off a cassette of one hand ca- clapping. That stuff rules, man. And it's just, it, it's going to, it's, it's outlasted all my relationships. It's outlasted all my, <laughs> my beard growing activities. And it's going to be there with me. And it blows my mind that now with this record, I'm a part of the album's history. And the reviews have been fantastic. And Denny is super proud of it. You know, this is the first time Denny's played these songs on record since then. And the fact that he saw it through and, loved it enough to put his name on it you know god i mean it blows my mind and i'm you know i have had some people say eh, you know why why does this exist well i'd rather I, I i enjoy seeing the yin yang of the positive and the negative because it makes it really means that people are talking about the record and mm. that is the goal the and goal you can't please everybody anyway no i know how no, no, and it's fine, dude. I have to live with the fact that I love Biker like an icon. It's perfectly so fine. Do I. I like that song. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I want. <laughs> I never have a broken heart when it comes to this stuff because everybody's different, but everybody loves Ram. It's harder to find somebody. It's easier to find somebody that's never heard Ram than to find somebody that hates it. And well, it's I, I want to interrupt you because I have to get this in. My nephew, I have a 29 year old nephew. He, you know, he loves everything. Uh, when it comes to Paul, he loves Ram. I mean, uh, not every album, but Ram, he's really hooked on. He's 29. And he told me once, he said, this is, this is very, he called it like modern. I didn't really get that at the time. Like how you were saying earlier, how it still kind of works today. It's not dated or anything like that. Uh, and that's how he described it, my nephew, why he liked it. It sounded like something from today. And he loves Cap- Captain Beefheart. So you might have something there too. And, and he's talking about Monkberry Moon Delight all the time. And you might have something there. So I wanted to make sure you knew that. Well, dude, the, 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 the age range, one of the things that we were discussing with the label, it's like, you know, this label is a label that's uh, that's led by uh, Spirit of Unicorn is a division of Cherry Red that's, that's fronted by the management team of Yes. And they put out all the Yes stuff. They put out all the tribute stuff. They put out all the Asia stuff, ELP. And I said, look, guys, we're going to have a little bit more of a varied response here because, you know, there's fans of Ram that are, you know, eight years old like me, like I was, and all the way up to 80. And then there's, you know, record collectors and Beatles nuts and Paul nuts. And, and there's also people that, that, you know, Ram, it's incredible to see the amount of people that have, that have been influenced by the record in their covers and their, in their, what they've said in, 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 in press, you know, I, I recently saw a thing about any man talking about how much she loves uh, Ram for its uh, Linda, Linda's backups and all that stuff. You know, it's a record that has a very huge uh, impact on society on musicians, on, on songwriters, on producers, on instrumentalists. Man, who who didn't want to learn how to play guitar after hearing too many people? Hmm. You know, ah, man, that's some of the greatest guitar playing ever put on record. Some of the most electrifying guitar playing ever put on record. And it's unhinged. It's amazing. It's incredible. And the thing about it is that it's a record that still flies out of your speakers and grabs you and says, listen to me. <laughs> I'm wondering, have you considered doing some live shows? I mean, it, now COVID's maybe getting better and more venues opening and maybe playing this around with some, some people? What do you think? Denny says as long as he doesn't have to set up his drums, he's down to play. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, knowing, knowing the enthusiasm of people that love him, knowing how many friends he has, uh, he's not going to have find a problem finding roadies. Now, you know, and then, you know, look, I'm a huge fan of Pierre McCartney. Uh, we actually uh, contacted Mike Viola to sing something, but scheduling didn't work out. I'm a huge Mike Viola fan. And I love that Pierre McCartney concert. And, you know, we could do something similar to that with Denny. Um, and the, thing, the beautiful thing about this is that there's enough musicians in L.A. that we could put together a Ram band and everybody's on the record. Oh yeah. There's not mm-hmm. in New York. Musicians everywhere where we could just travel and just 
put together ram bands and do two rehearsals and nail it. Yep. But the thing about it is we're still waiting to see all the clubs. We don't want to do this in any podunk little, you know, hundred person club. We right. want to do places like the Troubadour, maybe hope, maybe, maybe, maybe Hollywood Bowl, maybe, you oh. know, a uh, New York. It would be amazing to do this at uh, like uh, maybe a Highline Ball, Highline uh, Ballroom or, or a Hammerstein Ballroom or, you know, that type of vibe, like a 6,000 seater. And it would be awesome because every show will have different people coming out, you know, finding Ram fans is not hard. You know, mm-hmm. and it'll be really, really cool to do a live concert and, you know, film it. And having Denny there behind the drums is going to add so much cool to it because, man, I've seen him live. He beats the crap out of the drums. He's he's no stuck. He's still that badass that you see in all the, you know, there's a drummer on the record. Um, there's a, you know, Denny plays all the drums, but we had some drummers play percussion. And there's only, uh, there's uh, one track, uh, Heart of the Country, where, uh, my friend Matt Tecchio, who's from the Echo and the Canyon band, plays bass drum and hi hat. And uh, he said that the moment he told his mom he wanted a drum kit was when he saw the James Paul McCartney special, and he saw mm-hmm. Denny Denny Sywell being a badass with those that mustache and sideburns and long hair and, <laughs> and you know being a badass. And he said, "Mom, I want to be a drummer." You know. This is this is incredible that we are so lucky that we still have Denny Lane, Denny Sywell, Lawrence Juber, Steve Holly. Mm, yep. uh, I, I really hope that Joe English uh, finds a better place and gets away from the cult he's in. You know, because <laughs> my God, that guy. We yeah, yeah. we'd love to and talk I'm to him. So yeah. Denny, I say, look, man, you know, I love you. Joe, Joe was my jam too you know and he saw joe uh, he says joe was really nice to him um because he he uh, got invited to uh the show out here in la at the forum uh for wings over america and uh he says it was a completely different vibe it oh, was absolutely. a completely different vibe because uh you know wings was a real band when denny was in it henry was in it you know there was no bathroom on that bus you know, they they did sometimes slept on the bus. You know, they had it was a real band situation. By Wings Over America, it was more like Paul Wings, but it was more of a of a of a uh, of a production. There's the horn section. Everyone's in suits. Everyone's staying at four star hotels. It's a different vibe. But man, I I actually I'll plug this. Um, I uh, I was asked to. Uh, give quotes to the new Paul Sally Little Wing uh, Jimmy yep. McCulloch. Mm. We love Paul. Oh yeah, yep. Yep. Um, Jimmy McCulloch was one of the f- was the same way that Matt Techu took a look at Denny Sidewell and said, "I want to be a guitar. I want to be a drummer." I took one look at Jimmy McCulloch and said, "I want to be that guy." Mm. And and uh, that solo on on Junior's Farm still <laughs> yeah makes the hair on my arm. Yeah, the yeah. solo yeah. that nobody ever talks about. That blows my mind. I think it I know what you're gonna end say. End <laughs> solo on the note you never wrote. There you go. My God, yeah. that hard that the, when it goes in the feedback on the last note mm. blows my mind. I got chills just thinking about it. Um, the talk box solo on Wino Junko, the mm-hmm. the, uh, the the intense live solo at the end of Beware My Love, man. I'm, Yep. What a rocket that kid was. He was like 5'2", right. you know. <laughs> yeah. hey, look, look, I'm going to show you something very funny. So this is my 66 Gibson SG. And this is what it looks like on a normal-sized person. On Jimmy, it looked like a 335. It looked like a jazz box on me. And it's like, I remember getting my first SG and looking in the mirror and going, why does this thing look like a Steinberger on me? Why does it look so small? Because you know you see you see Jimmy and it's like it's big on oh, him. Yeah. It's tiny, me, man. Poor so, guy. <laughs> really, fun. really, really. By the way, really geeky. Um, this is a um, the Epiphone just re re uh, just reissued this thing called an Epiphone Coronet, and 
the reason why I bought this guitar, well, the reason why most people have been going gaga over this is that it's the Steve Marriott um, Humble Pie guitar. And a bunch of guys use this. But the reason I bought it is that this is the Robbie McIntosh mm. off the ground tour slide guitar. Mm. So he used this on off the ground and right. biker and icon. Right. And it's in all the videos and all the live performances and the Charlotte video. And the first time I saw Paul was on the off the ground tour and he played this guitar. And I said, I, I'm actually, I want to get the uh, Madonna figure that was on the screens. The, the from the biker like an icon single mm, right with the bike helmet i want to put that right here yeah nice <laughs> beautiful very cool i just um, broke it ah, oh no <laughs> no really oh no i just i just knocked the knob off of it oh, oh no, no. no that's funny no i i i i'm i'm a real i'm a real player so i i this thing is going to be full of dents and everything because i'm a, i'm a kind of a, an aggressive player so i'm not I, and I play the crap out of that guitar so it's like you know it's all good but I, i'm a real i'm a real lifer when it comes to this so you know when people ask who's this guy look i've been training to do ram on since i was eight years old i got my first four track when i was 12 i got my my brother my older brother worked for Motorola and he got a house and had an extra room and said, Hey, you might you want to have a studio? I'm like, Yeah. He's like, Well, you're gonna have a studio, but we're gonna do it my way. I'm building a computer. This was in 97, 98. We're gonna record on computers. And I said, You're crazy. And running Cubase one, we were recording on computers in 98, which is unheard of. So I've been working on computers for a long time. And my entire work ethic is based on the sounds that I fell in love with. And when it comes down to it, Ram is in my top five favorite sounding albums of all time, my favorite production albums of all time, my favorite albums of all time, period. But that album sounds like a million bucks. And I wanted to have that warmth. I wanted to have that feel. And I wanted to have that work ethic. And, you know, I learned everything about how they made those records from Denny. And there's a lot of organic energy on that record. There's a lot of that vibe of, you know, the, the joy and passion over technical perfection. You know, right. there's some stuff on that record that isn't perfect, you know, mm -hmm. but that's what makes it so cool. You yeah. know, that's right. what makes why so cool. I mean, you know, that record, they went into Abbey Road and recorded on the floor live. Right. And you could tell, and it's not yeah. perfect, but man, it's got vibe, well, you know, replay. Yes. Speaking of, you know, if, if this album goes, if it does well, sells well, what do you guys think about possibly covering a wildlife? We already won song in the wildlife. Oh. Yes. Well, yeah, yes. you did. Some people are, some people never some know. Some people never know. Yeah. Some people <laughs> never know. <laughs> so that means we only have uh, eight more seven, songs. Right. Seven more songs left. Right. And I would, I would want to do. I would want to do uh, give Ireland back to the Irish. Mm -hmm. and there's some songs that we didn't get to from the Ram sessions that I'd love to do. I would love to do Red Rose. I would love to do, and I've talked to him about this is okay. I just praise Biker like an icon, and I'm just going to blow your minds and say my least favorite Wings album. It's a tie between. It's a tie between. Back to the Egg and Band on the Run. I love Back to the Egg. I love Band on the Run. But both those records have something that irks me. And it's on the production level. Because Back to the Egg, he was going for a punk ethic. So a lot of the sounds are of the time. A lot of the performances are more raw and less melodic. There's stuff on that record that happens that's a little more aggressive than what I would have wanted and sometimes abrasive. But the problem with Band of the Run is that Lago Studio was a mess. The drums sound like complete crap. It's really a, not a good drum sound. A lot of the guitar sounds and a lot of the stuff is phasing, so it sounds thin. My chronological history of hearing these songs was, I got Wings Over America first. I first heard Jet and Band on the Run and Bluebird on that record. And mm. I put on Band on the Run when I finally got it. 
And something was missing. It didn't have the warmth or the energy. And I've been talking to Denny about this. So the tapes, when Paul got jumped in Lagos and they stole his tapes, they stole the rehearsal tapes right. of Wings rehearsing Ben on the Run. Denny, Henry, Denny Lane, Linda, Paul in Scotland at Root Studio, running all the songs and working out all the parts. Right. Denny says, as much as he loves Paul as a drummer, there was something missing. And it was a shadow of what it could have been. Yeah. And part of me wants to say, all right, Denny, let's throw away the script on that one and see what you remember about the way it sounded with him. Interesting. Mm, cool. I know Denny has told me that, that Paul kind of patterned his drumming around what Denny was doing. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. But the problem with that record is that they should have abandoned the studio when they saw what condition it was in. Mm. This is this. I'm gonna get geeky on this. They only had one good mic. They had one Neumann U87. Everything else was a, was literally not even 57s, like crap, like real crap microphones. They didn't really have any, you know, proper keyboards, or they didn't fly their Mellotron out there. They didn't have the right stuff. They ended up doing most of the stuff later on in sweetening sessions at Abbey Road. But it's a weak sounding record. And even like it, it while it helps songs like 1985 and 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 and, uh, and and Mrs. Vanderbilt and you know it helps on songs like that. But songs where I really feel that that stuff is missing is you know Band on the Run and Jet, you know, just pale in comparison. And I I I would love to hear those with a little more oomph, aside from what we've all become all accustomed to with the Wings Over America band, with the Chris Witten, Brother Cunningham, Abe Jr. sound, you know, yeah. which, man, I mean, those songs came alive in 89 and 93. And man, you go see Jet live and it's a mind blower. Man on the run. <laughs> mind yeah. blower. You know, when you hear that record, I hear restraint. I hear Paul not hitting the drums harder, hard, hard enough because the drum kit was falling apart. I hear guitar tones that are guitar plugged into the, into the console because the amps were not working. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it sounds like a demo to me, you know? Mm -hmm. Wow. So interesting. the whole yeah, last thing was a disaster. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. But I oh. wish, I wish that the Denny Henry situation would have lasted at least one more record. Oh, absolutely. And they would have done oh, that. Yeah. Coming off a of Red Rose, which is such a freaking triumph, because you take, I guarantee you that if Denny and Henry would have left before Red Rose, My Love, Big Barn Bed, you know, all those tunes would have not been as majestic. Um, live and Let Die, my God. Yeah. You know, Live and Let Die is a masterpiece. Yeah, Denny is, sure. you know, uh, We were watching the Oscars recently and um, you know, this year, because of the COVID thing, instead of having a live orchestra, they had Questlove DJing yeah. and played Live and Let Die. And it sounded like a million bucks coming out yeah. of commercial. And I'm like, immediately calling Denny. I'm like, you're on the Oscars. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is relationship goals, by the way. Right. Denny was watching the football game. It was his wife that heard Live and Let Die watching the Oscars in another room. Yeah. And she said, you're on the Oscars. <laughs> <laughs> Will so will we see this on vinyl? Good news. Um, <laughs> the label said if we sell enough CDs, we'll do vinyl. Within the first week, they gave us the okay, and they're oh, sending the templates great. over. Our goal is to have them by Christmas. Oh, congratulations! Oh, that's, great. That's, that's excellent. Great. Great. Some, too. So we'll see what happens. We have some more stuff to put on. So we'll see how it goes. But there's definitely going to be more artwork and more stuff, and we're going to do videos and some other things. You know, we want to do uh, some uh, performance videos and some other stuff. So, 
this is going to be a long and fun process of ramming on. We'll, we'll, we'll be there with you. Absolutely. Oh, I'm still Absolutely. pitching stuff because I've got right. the epic things, but look, I got to develop some information here. Paul said cool album to Denny. Great. I was going to ask you if, if you had gotten any reaction from mm. him. So, yes. MPL Congratulations. Yes. MPL asked for 10 copies. Right. And I have confirmation that Paul has texted Denny and said, great, cool album. Fantastic. Congratulations. My entire career is completely going to be derailed from now on because it's never going <laughs> to you know, I've done some epic stuff. You know, I just did a new version of Hurricane with the original violinist of uh, Bob Dylan and uh, Scarlett. Scarlett Rivera is actually joining uh, Nine Mile Station, this band I play with. So it's it's really cool. I've did you know I've I've gotten to work with. I did a record with Coleman a piece recently, and you know that Echo in the Canyon thing was a. I played on a track with Eric Clapton, mm -hmm. but all that pales in comparison to the fact that this new version of Ram. Is approved by Paul, he digs it, and the very tough and very critical McCartney Masses seems to have uh, accepted it with open arms, and we haven't gotten any hate mail or terrible reviews, you know, so <laughs> my job is done. No, I've done <laughs> Drop <laughs> Mike. Mike drop. Denny, Mike Denny drop, still, yeah. Denny's still a great friend of mine. You know, we hang out. Every time I go over there to do an interview, when doing interviews, he's like, let's jam. He's got two drum kits set up and we jam the hell out of each other. We just like, you know, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, and he, he enjoys working with me and hanging out. With me. And we're all so lucky that he's still around and Marvin yeah. and Spinoza and, you know, uh, I'm glad that they were able to revisit their stuff. And in some cases, like Spinoza used the same Telecaster he used on another day. Oh, I wow. joked to Mark, like, by any chance, did you use the same flugelhorn? He's like, oh, I, I didn't. Is that okay? I'm like, no, it's fine. I mean, I know that flugelhorns don't last. Like, they're not, they're, they're not, they're not like guitars, you know, that you, you kind of get a new horn every five years. It's like, I still have it. I could recut it. I'm like, no, it's fine. It's fine. You know, I'm a little bit of a dork. But the fact that Denny's there playing the same snare drum he did back in 1970, rocking these parts, sounding incredible, you know, it warms me heart. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, Excellent. Well, Fernando, yeah. we really want to thank you for being here. This was a true, true gift for you yeah. uh, coming on here and telling us the experience, you know, working with Denny and, you know, the Paul story and, and your love for and passion for McCartney's music. And um, we really thank you for taking your time. Appreciate it. My pleasure. This was a lot of fun. Every interview has been great. And, and, but this one, I love working with you guys because, the questions have been spot on and your your knowledge and your love for this stuff is really obvious and thank you, thank you for being passionate to the point of you know getting together with four people with completely different styles of of interviewing you know all coming together to create the ultimate show and that's this show thank, you. Thank, thank you. you thank you Thanks. thank you well it's, it's, it's kind of like the view you know <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> Except without hair pulling right. and all that kind of stuff. Well, right. so, if you guys are all in the same room together, you'd be pulling hair. Right. Well, right. Maybe. You know, right. maybe. Right. Yeah. So so um we can get the album on Amazon, we can get the album at Cherry yes. Records. Yes. Uh, also, but it's on Target, it's on a few other things, a uh, rough trade. Um, you know, we, we went with a British label. So, you know, their distribution is there, but they've been having some trouble with Amazon. Right. But have patience. it'll get to you when it gets to you. And when it gets to you, you're going to love it. So order yeah, away. Have, have fun. Uh, it's it's really a, a, a passion project for all everybody involved. And we're all happy to get into your ears, you know, with this incredible music. So right. Thank you. Um, we're going to do the round table real quick. We'll talk about everybody, what everybody else has got going on. Well, we got the plug. Uh, Kit, why don't we start with you real quick? Okay. You can, of course, uh, find me on my Facebook page. You can find me um, on Twitter at Kit O'Toole. Um, and I'm going to be doing my own show uh, this week. Uh, just check me on my Facebook page for uh, the time because I'm going to be doing it from the beach. 
but uh, I don't know when yet because I'm waiting for it to be really good weather. Uh, so, uh, so just check for my Facebook uh, and I will let you know uh, the day and time as soon as I can. So uh, also, of course, you can reach us at uh, talkmoretalk.com. You can uh, find us on Twitter at talkmoretalk1. That's number one. Um, and you can find us um, on, of course, any podcasting platform that you can imagine and on our YouTube channel, uh, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles videocast. This episode will be up very soon. Yay. there. Yeah. And yes, indeed. And I will send it to you, Fernando, as soon as it's up. Uh, and, uh, and you will uh, find that. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel while you're there. And of course, we always want your feedback at talkmoresolotalk at gmail.com. Excellent. Thank you, Kit. Uh, Joe, take it away. Well, folks, please subscribe to my channel on YouTube, Mean Mr. Mayo. Um, recently, I did uh, a little stint on Ken Michaels' YouTube channel, the, the uh, what is it called, Ken Michaels Radio, and right. we did a new uh, little game called Fab Five. The Fab right? Five, yes. And that's what it's called. It's a new thing that he's doing, and uh, it's it's supposed to be up fairly soon. So be on the lookout for that. Could be tomorrow. Okay. okay. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Ken, what's going on with you? Well, uh, first of all, I have to say, unfortunately, I have a, a serious um, family health crisis that I have to attend to, and it will keep me from doing uh, my podcast shows for uh, two weeks, hopefully not more than that. So I won't be on the next Talk More Talk. And we haven't decided yet about the next things we said today podcast, but hopefully it won't be more than, than two weeks. Um, but as Joe just said, um, for my YouTube channel, I've actually recorded in anticipation of this, a couple of interviews that I can put on my, my YouTube channel. One of which is the interview with Joe. Uh, the show is called, this is a, a new concept, the Fab Five, where I ask my guest to name, he has to name uh, one Beatles album and one uh, solo album from each Beatle that are your go-to albums right now. The okay. ones you want to listen to the most. Does it have to be the best right one now. or your favorite one? <laughs> if all of a sudden your favorite McCartney album that you want to hear is Flaming Pie, okay, you explain why. Right. You know, it's that's the concept can behind I play that. that game? <laughs> What's that? Can I play that game? You can. Anytime you <laughs> want. I'll set you up where as soon as um this this health problem is uh, resolved. Hey, a few look, weeks, man, we'll do something. We will do something. You do what you got to do. The good thing about all this stuff is that it means you're going to have an amazing comeback. Mm -hmm. You know? And that's well, it. We're going to miss so, you. There's so many people I got lined up <laughs> to do <laughs> interviews for the, yep. for the YouTube channel. And, you know, the, the amazing thing about this thing, which I never even thought about, is that it's like you have your own TV show. And you could be on right. once a week. You could be on every day of the week if you want to. They could yeah. be 20 minutes long. They could be an hour long. Right. You determine, you know, all the rules. But um, I also did an interview with Alan Cozen hmm. from uh, Things We Said Today, my colleague there on that show. And we talk about what was the Beatles peak as a band creatively. We debate oh. about that. So that's also going to be out probably next week. And uh, Things We Said Today, like I said, uh, we'll be discussing whether or not they'll do a show without me in the interim. Uh, still, I have my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com. There will still be Beatles trivia like I have every single week where you can win one of 10 prizes. I'm hoping to give away Ram On as a prize. And if I do, it will be on my Beatles trivia and games page. And I might also give away a copy through my YouTube page as well. Thank you. Um, I also just want to mention, like I said before, there's lots of great interviews with Fernando and Danny Sywell all over the internet. Tom did one on the Two Legs uh, podcast with, with Danny and Fernando. I yeah. did one, one the first, what's that? One of the first ones we did. Yeah, yeah. one of the first yeah. ones, yeah. And cool. uh, I, I did one separately with Fernando, one separately with, uh, with Danny. You can also find uh, an interview with Hudson Ranny on I Know I Know. The one I mentioned, Elliot Roberts, Sam Wiles interviewed each of you uh, individually. So there's plenty to go around if you want, if you can't get enough of Ram. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> so ram on everybody yeah. Yeah. Um, in, in the uh the two legs world uh we just posted our our interview with timmy sean who did two uh, yeah two lead vocals on the ram on he did a uh, smile away and and he knocked the monkberry moon delight out of the out of no, the- that was great that's my he favorite track incredible. i think he oh yeah just- i wanted to ask everyone who your favorite tracks are but really quick about timmy sean i told him if you see blood on the microphone stop <laughs> I, was worried, <laughs> I was worried about him doing doing yeah. doing damage to his voice, but he's right. one of the most incredible singers, and he's actually an incredible drummer. And and there's right. a, a funny story with him. He talked about the uh, Lavatory Lil. He got right, right, yeah. before the album came out, which is crazy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So that that's uh, on his YouTube channel, uh, Timmy Sean. You can check out his cover of Laboratory Lil. He's got a bunch of new music out that you can check out as well. So we had a great discussion with with Timmy Sean um, on his experience working with Fernando and Denny and the the Ram on. Um, next week we're gonna or this coming week we just did the uh, the ultimate classic rock question thing where we did the uh, the last uh, good, the last great, and first bad um, uh, McCartney records. So we thought we 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 do our take on that so that'll be posted uh this saturday uh we just uh, we last week we ranked memory almost full the tracks on that this week we're going to be ranking the tracks on egypt station so that'll be live wednesday night Ooh. yes so busy as always um and and that's it for right now please check out our youtube channel as well two legs of paul mccartney podcast and please subscribe as all of our stations please awesome and we, really and quick really uh, yeah go ahead What's your favorite track on Ramon and why? And let's ask that for everybody, and then I'll tell you mine. Okay. Um, I, I really appreciate uh, Adrian's uh, vocals on Dear Boy. Uh, I just, you know, really, <laughs> no, really good. I, I was going to name that one, too. <laughs> yeah, production. I mean, everything about it, I think, just works works beautifully. Um, I, I think it's one of the uh, Paul's better sung songs at that period. Um, so I was really happy with how his approach on that, and I think he uh, he not he did a great job with it. Awesome. Uh, I'd have to say one haired lady. I, I just love it. It's almost like a story. Um, and I love, I love your take on it. Um, I mean, it's, you know, just the, the dialogue. Um, and as, as I, I think uh, you said, Ken, boy, Carney Wilson just nails Linda's <laughs> yep. sound. Wow. <laughs> I mean, wow. And, uh, it, and, and I just thought the whole production on it, uh, Fernando and on your version was just spot on. So hard, hard call, but I think that's yeah. my favorite. <laughs> yeah. so- well, I already said Monkberry Moon Delight, but uh, Dear Boy was, I was going to say next, uh, when you, I like the vocals on that. And I, I, I mean, you can only pick one, right? But only, so I'll only pick one. Uh, too many people. Smile away. <laughs> yeah. those, those are the ones that st- stood out the most to me. I remember on my one listen so far that I. Awesome. I yeah. uh, it's real difficult for me. I'd probably go with Monkberry Moon Delight just because you know how difficult it is to do those vocals. <laughs> but right. I do want to have a shout out to A Woman Oy. And yeah. I really like that right. version that's on there because yeah. you turned it into a duet. Right. Which yeah. Which is a complete that was brilliant. Yeah. Both sides of the story are finally represented. Yes. There's, yes. There's the boyfriend and the girlfriend that shoots him. <laughs> yeah, that was a brilliant idea. Yeah. yeah I think that actually, was the only thing that was really missing from the album was the gunshots, right? No, it's on there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're okay. on there. Yeah. It's yeah. on there. But it's, uh, as loud. it's not as loud. Right. We'll fix it yeah. for the vinyl. No, okay, it's, it's, there you go. It's there. Um, my personal favorite on the record is always going to be too many people uh, because it was the first one and there's just something about the vibe and the way that Dan Rothschild sang that just blew my mind. But, you know, there's something about that dear boy that just, oh, mm. just mm. absolutely blows my way. Like, it's like, you know, pick your favorite child, you know, it's right. very hard. Yeah. But it's tough. The, being there and watching these songs grow was an incredible process. And uh, uh, God, you know, back to my car. Uh, we I just recently posted the uh, um, the uh, if you go to my YouTube page. You'll find the, uh, um, the isolated string horns on that. And oh, it's a freaking masterpiece. Right. Of, I of a, I heard that. Oh my gosh! Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's got everything that you love about you know George Her- George George Martin's uh, 
you know, as a fan of the of the Yellow Submarine uh, soundtrack, you know, there's something about those orchestrations that make you feel like a kid again. And hearing those separate is a real revelatory rel- rel- situation. So, yeah, again, I right. can't just pick one, but, you know, too many people being the first one, being the one where Denny said, you're a badass. I want to work right. with you. <laughs> that's always going to stick with me you know sure sure cool cool well, fernando we wish you the most success with, with this record and you know we're going to be here helping pushing this record and 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 we're we're behind it we love it and Thank you. um you know it's man I, we bow to you <laughs> it's you know the hard, the hard work paid off and it and absolutely you should be very proud which i we can tell you are very proud of this uh of this, uh, look, of this album. look man Again, Paul's four words, mm-hmm. you know, sounds good, have fun. It made it harder and easier at the same time. Right. And uh, the fact that he digs it, the fact that everybody that's heard it, you know, has very nice things to say about it. The fact that even the people that, that, that were skeptical have been won over. Yeah. That's, that's a real joy because look, you know, like it or not, everyone's talking about Ram right now. And mm-hmm. that's a better world as far, as far as I'm concerned that's a better world here because right. you know we've had a really tough year right we've lost yeah. a lot of people you know um we've had a lot of uh, heartbreak and uh to have an album like ram turn 50 and still be so loved and so influential to us and to have so many amazing memories of hearing this record and to have an album like ram on happen where there's a ho- over 100 people ranging from age 10 to age 80 we had people in japan in germany and in england and everywhere you know look every part of america you know it's it's a beautiful thing and it's a um the ram anniversary has been epic and uh, <laughs> i like that that's great like that. yeah that's very I, good cool. i hope you do a lot more in mccartney's right. catalog yep. absolutely. Uh, absolutely all right you know maybe maybe uh what Denny would have sounded like on Wings of the Speed of Sound. Um, there you go. There you go. <laughs> the possibilities and, and are endless. Exactly. And we'd love for you to come back on our show anytime. Oh, love- yep. Love and my you. YouTube channel. Yep. I Absolutely. enjoy it. I enjoy all yeah. of this. And, uh, it's never been a better time to be a McCartney fan. Holy oh, crap. It's I mean, the, 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 the sure. releases are fast and furious. The Energizer right Bunny. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. Know, Seriously. So, right. Box so, set, box- Box sets have gotten bigger. What you know, I, I grew up in the age of like you know the four disker, and now it's right. Like, oh yeah, yeah. I got King the uh, the Bob Dylan biography right here, and it was like album size. You know those box sets back then in the in the eighties, early nineties. You know, Jimmy Kimmel made a great joke. I think it was Jimmy Kimmel, and he said uh, uh, he said uh, there's a new uh, Grateful Dead eighteen disc box set coming out. It still hasn't been announced what song it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So thank you again, Fernando. So for Kittle Tool, Joe Mayo, Ken Michaels, Fernando Perdomo, I'm Tom Hanyari saying, oh, we believe that we can't be wrong. <laughs> Peace. <Okay. laughs> Take care, Ram everybody. Ram on. <laughs> Ram on. Ram on, everybody. Much love. Thank you. <laughs>